picture on the left with the fighter jet is uh, it has these windows, these little thermopile devices on two axes, and it detects the thermal, uh, the, uh, thermal differential between the sky and the ground. When we go outside, even on a day like today, uh, you know, where the ground's covered in snow and ice, the ground is still going to have a warmer heat signature than the sky or than space. And so because we get a nice little uh, bell curve, like you can see in the lower right-hand corner, we can take these values in and then just using a microcontroller and a very simple algorithm, we can then send out signals to our servos, which will move our control surfaces and level the plane out. Um, this device right here will level us out in two axes. Going like this and like this. So I can't remember the names. I think it's like pitch and something, but you know, whatever. We'll deal with that later. So servos. Um, servos are kind of a, an important thing to, uh, to know with a plane because these are the mechanisms that move the control surfaces. Many of you um, may be familiar with these. don't think I was supposed to say that. But uh, essentially, it's just a motor uh, control circuit and a potentiometer. And they're controlled by sending out a pulse width modulated signal every two milliseconds. And you can just rotate the arm, usually about 180 degrees from left to right or 90 degrees. Some models are continuous rotating, like on the parallax robots, where they actually use the servos just to turn wheels and, and drive robots around. Uh, we use these to um, make very precise movements to the control surfaces, like the ailerons, the elevators, the rudders on a plane. And this is what's essentially going to allow us control over our airframe. So now, the brains of the operation. The Ardu pilot. This is the $25 autopilot that made uh, a bit of a splash on the scene about a year and a half, two years ago. It's based around the popular Ardu pilot microcontroller and was created by a guy named Jordi Munoz. Um, Jordi Munoz met the Wired editor in chief, Chris Anderson, and together they kind of built a community called DIYDrones.com. Now, this community is the place to go if you're interested in UAVs. It's, you know, uh, let, me, let me caveat that. If you're interested in making your own UAV. These guys are the ones who like to know everything from, from nuts to, or soup to nuts, and uh, they build their own systems from the ground up. Um, their focus is on inexpensive um, systems, and everything that they publish is open source and open hardware. So they're a great reference. I highly recommend you guys check that website out if you're interested. So the Ardu Pilot, uh, about a year ago, they released a shield, which if you guys are familiar with Arduinos, shields are just uh, circuit boards that just snap on top of, um, of the base board. The Ardu Pilot shield brings a couple more uh, systems to, to play in an easy, integrated, and very small fashion. Here you can see that black box with the two uh, nozzles coming out. That is a differential pressure sensor. And when we connect a rubber hose to a, a tube out front, we can measure airspeed. This also has uh, some circuitry that allows us to update the code on the uh, microcontroller without having to unplug the GPS since they both share a single serial line, which is a disadvantage. I'll talk about how uh, the community is overcoming now. But anyways, when you mount the shield on top of the Ardu pilot board, you essentially have all the basic components that you need for a fully integrated autopilot system. Now, Ardu Pilot's gone through a couple different uh, generations. They're currently on generation 2.5, version 2.5 of their code. And uh, the system overview has changed slightly. Initially, they were using the FMA Copilot system to provide stabilization totally separate from the Ardu Pilot. But now, with the shield, you can actually connect the uh, thermopile systems directly in to the shield board, which communicates with the Ardu Pilot. And the Ardu Pilot makes all the calculations for us. So we we take that third-party application out of, the, uh, out of the picture. As you can see here, though, I just want to point out, we have a RC uh, receiver on here. Um, this isn't a completely autonomous system. I guess the best way to put it is semi-autonomous. Takeoff and landing still has to be done manually at the moment. This is a problem that the community is working on. But it's also important for uh, FAA legal issues that we be able to take control of the plane, you know, safety's sake. Let's say yesterday I was flying the plane and you know, it starts to head on over to the vice president's house. I'm probably going to want to flip a switch and bring it back before I get arrested. So um, that's a, a key component I just want to point out. But anyways, it's received signals just dump right into the Ardu pilot, which then connects straight to the servos, to the electronic speed controller in the bottom right, which is essentially our throttle. This gives us uh, filtered power for all our, our devices, connects the battery, and also allows, uh, or also connects to the, uh, to the motor. 
which is going to be our main uh, thrust source, obviously. And the shield, of course, the, the GPS plugs into that, and we have our, uh, our sensors. So right here, these are all the systems that you need, essentially, to have a complete semi-autonomous autopilot system. So when the entire system is integrated onto the airframe, it looks something like this. Now, the GPS system that I'm using, I keep internal because uh, I kind of upgraded uh, the GPS model. This, liter this picture here is about six months old, and these guys keep coming up with new updates, uh, probably on a two, three month basis. But as you can see in the front, uh, in the front, you know, kind of hole right there, you have the Ardu pilot with the shield and everything plugging into that, that mess of wires. The battery also is going to be located up front. There's a lot of space up there. You see the Z sensor on the side. This is just thermopiles looking up and down. This gives us better calibration data for uh, the X and the Y sensor, which is on top. And then uh, we have our GPS, which we just kind of keep out of the way and with a clear uh, view of the sky. That black box on the in the middle uh, side there is the servo, and that uh, connects to a control wire, which will move either the uh, aileron or, I'm sorry, either the elevator or the rudder for control. In the front, like I mentioned earlier, the pitot tube, essentially we just have a metal tube that's sticking out of the foam somewhere, and it's connected to a little hose and goes to that differential pressure sensor. So this is just going to direct uh, you know, the airstream to the sensor so we can see how fast we're going. I mounted it on the side. I don't know if you guys in the back can see. But I like to put it back here, kind of you know, more resembling a, a normal pitot tube uh, setup that you'd see on a regular aircraft. But really, anything works. You can just kind of push it through the foam up front. Too easy. An awesome creation by the DIY drones community is the Ardu Pilot config tool. This is a software, this is a little software uh, script, or I guess an application that was written by the community that allows you to just pull up a Google Maps interface and then just drop waypoints where you want the, uh, the plane to fly. Um, really awesome features of this include uh, Google Maps supplying us the data of, uh, of, uh, of the ground, you know, the, I'm sorry, uh, the, uh, the ground level, wherever we happen to be at, and then you can specify how much higher you want the plane to be. Um, some members of the community noticed uh, initially when they were using just GPS coordinates that uh, their planes would kind of fly into the side of mountains. And so this was an issue. They, they quickly rewrote the code to kind of include this. But um, this was for this specific setup where you see this bow tie pattern here. The community has, I think every two months, they throw out a new contest where you can go on there and uh, you, you know, look at the rules and everything. In this case, you had to fly a certain pattern. Um, I think it was a like 300 or 200 uh, meter uh, square cube that you had to fly in a certain uh, in a certain orientation, and then you film the entire thing, and you send all your telemetry data and everything off to the website. And they, uh, in this case, it was a time trial. So the person that got their UAV around this the fastest won. A uh, cool thing was you could submit it using any plane and any system as long as it was, uh, you know, kind of within our category. Obviously, I think the Air Force was excluded because they, they would have won. Um, I think the winner. Oh, man, I want to say he did it in less than a minute. Yeah, it, this thing was, you know, he like punched the throttle up and it's flying all over the sky. Probably crashed afterwards, I don't know. I, I didn't make the top ten list, so anybody that was ahead of me, whatever. <laughs> yeah. I was happy that it actually made it around. I was like, oh, sweet, this worked. <laughs> and then it kind of flew into the side of a building and that was the day. <laughs> yeah. So telemetry, I mentioned the, uh, the data that you need to get back down to the ground. Uh, Zigbee radios really are ideal for this purpose. These things are tiny. I mean, they're only a couple credit cards thick. It's just a, a simple board. Um, here you see the two that I use. The one on top is my ground station one. I have that. I use the RPSMA models because I can attach any antenna I want to them. And uh, it has a SparkFun uh, breakout board on the bottom, which gives me really easy USB connectivity to my computer. So I just run a serial. Um, monitor on my computer and, you know, just save all the data. The one on the bottom is using a breakout board from LadyAda.com, which gives us the pinouts. And uh, we just push serial data directly from the microcontroller right to that. And, uh, you know, you can get that, you know, seamless uh, serial link. If you use the right models and the right antennas, you can get a 12, about a 12-mile 12 range out of these things. Uh, the range is kind of decreased a bit by whatever your video setup happens to be. If you don't have good filtering, and everything we'll talk about